So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Thank you, Jared. I don't know if you recognize yourself or not. What an exciting time just to be able to worship God and uh, thank you, Justin, for those songs. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the songs. I know a while back we talked about a survey and a lot of you filled out a survey. And so I'm going to try to do three parts today. Hopefully they all will work together. First, we want to look at Nehemiah and about how God works among his people. And secondly, how God works among his church. And then we want to talk a little bit about the survey and make some things that are practical and uh, just to inform you what you said and let you know where we are on things. How's that? Uh, Nehemiah is a very interesting story. It's found in the Old Testament. They had been taken into captivity. They had spent 70 years in captivity, exactly the time that God had prescribed. Then... uh, Nehemiah is one that realizes that, you know, things have not been so good, that the walls have not been rebuilt. And so it's a process getting all of the people from their captivity back to the time where they are once more in the promised land and uh, under the will of God and doing everything. Just to give you a little bit of insight into uh, what happens, um, let me show you this chart. Uh, You have the 70 years of captivity, you have Zerubbabel returning and rebuilding the temple, you have Ezra coming and being able to proclaim all the laws, and then you have Nehemiah who finds out that everything is not perfect, they have no city walls, they have no police, they have no, there's no way for anything to happen, And, and they're completely unprotected, it's unsafe. People come and steal their crops. They come and it's just not a good situation. And so he asked permission from Artaxerxes to come back and rebuild the walls. The passage that Jared has read to us basically says they were able to rebuild all of the walls in 52 days. That's an incredible feat. I don't know if you realize what that's like or not, but how long it takes to rebuild those walls and how long it takes to do those things. From the first time one came back, when Zerubbabel first returned until the time when Nehemiah is able to go back is 92 years. How can it take 92 years And then they can do it all in 52 days. That just seems impossible. But I think we realize that sometimes we wait around, sitting around, thinking of, well, this ought to happen, this ought to happen, this ought to happen. And when we ever actually get around to doing something with it, it really didn't take that much time. But we spent a lot of time thinking it ought to happen and not doing anything. And so I think that's what you run into here is they've got a situation where Nehemiah comes and what is it that he does? What is it that makes all of the difference here? Certainly it was God's will for them to come back, for them to rebuild their temple, their walls, their society, everything about them to be God's people again. And yet it seems to take a while. It did then, it does in church today, is my comparison. So how can we figure this out to where we can do something different about it? Well, I think here are some of the things that happened with Nehemiah. He came with resources. He had timber that was given to him. He was financed by King Artaxerxes. And so he comes with a few resources that he is able to do. The task looks overwhelming. The whole wall was broken down. If you realize what this wall, this wall is two and a half miles long. Well, that's a long wall. This wall, uh, when they get it built, is 39 feet high and eight feet thick. It's not like putting up the fence in your backyard. And if you were thinking about putting a wall around two and a half miles just in your neighborhood, 
That takes a lot of time. How many people do you have to have to build a wall like that? They had enemies that came and discouraged them, and so it's hard to, hard to realize when you have people who are there who are always discouraging, always talking against you, making fun of you, and essentially destroying the work. And so they didn't believe that they could. And when you don't believe you can, it's really hard for it to actually happen. It's really hard for us to act upon the fact that, yes, it can happen. And so they didn't believe God could or that God would use them. It was exactly the right time, exactly the right place. It had been prophesied, and yet they found no courage or strength to be able to make it happen. I think maybe they didn't realize their own resources. They didn't realize what they had because they're going to build the wall out of the bricks that were torn down. And so there are a number of things that are, you know, just laying flat on the ground. They just pulled them all out and all the block is still there. I mean, they didn't have timber for the gates and things like that, but the walls are laying there. But, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to look in the trash and see a treasure that this is what God wants us to use. And all they saw was the disaster. All they see is their failure. All they see is the destruction that Babylon had come and done. And they don't realize and they don't understand. They also didn't have anyone to organize them. I don't know if that makes a big difference or not. Can people just not do something until you get one that can organize them? It might be true. If you think about your life and think about how many things you've accomplished, it only took a short amount of time if you just ever could get organized, right? I mean, somehow that's the most impossible thing for us. And so Nehemiah did come back. He was able to organize them. He came back and he looked at the situation. He saw the, where the blocks were. He rode around the whole thing. He called the people together. He said, I think we can do this. That's all they needed. He said, let's start. And what they did is he assigned them a place. You build the wall in front of your house. And when they built the wall in front of their house, they found their neighbor was building the wall in front of his house. And in 52 days, they had completed a wall. But we never think about the guy next to me is going to build his part, and the guy on this side is going to build his part, and... It's not that, well, it is a big deal. This is a big wall. But we could do that. And I think it's when we finally realize and see what God's able to do. This isn't all the wall that they built. But this is the wall. That's a big wall. There's a lot that goes into that. And I want you to realize that this is the best explanation of church to me. Because we come as people who are completely disorganized, don't know how to manage our life or handle our life, and so we seem to get caught in sin and in all kinds of other things that are wasting our time and taking us off, and we're, we're completely destroyed because we don't understand what we're supposed to be doing that God is the one who created us, that God is the one who has a place for us, and we end up just kind of chasing after what we want over here and what somebody's selling over here and what somebody has down here, and we didn't really have a direction or a purpose in our life. And so I think that very much speaks to this situation. And when you think about what happens with Jesus when Jesus comes... It's amazing to watch how his church is built. The one phrase that you see is all of the people under Nehemiah had realized God did this. And when you're part of something that God has done, it tends to do away with the argument. People don't argue so much. They don't get so fearful because they realize this is something that's good. This is something we wanted to do. And they gain energy from each other to be able to accomplish this task. And what an incredible thing that is. And so they needed Nehemiah just to organize the work. And they needed to believe what God could do among them. 
As we look at what Jesus does in building his church, he tells his disciples, I am going to build my church. Even the gates of hell are not going to stand against it. I will build my church. And so he wasn't saying, I want me to come, and then I'm going to kind of leave it up to you, and you guys build it. He said, no, I am the one who's going to build my church, but I'm inviting you into the process of how this building takes place. And that's what he does with us as well. He invites us into this process of how we are able to help and build the church. You know how you do it? You build outside your front door. That's where you go reach the person God wants you to talk to is the person you see next, is the person who's around you. And if each one of us just reaches to the people that are outside our front door, we're going to do great things. We're going to be able to build this huge wall. We're going to be able to build this huge church as God is the one who's making all of this happen. And so I think it's incredible when you start realizing this. Jesus is the organizer. He's the source. He's the power. He's everything. It's his church. And we're just the people who get to work in it and watch how God pulls things together and the way in which God is able to do great things. He does need people here to organize and to do and to work together. He gives Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and he says, I want you to bind and loose realizing what heaven has done already and that what you're going to bind and loose is really because of what heaven has done because I'm up there and I'm the one who's giving call and making all of this happen so he's not asking disciples to build him for him but for them to be part of it and just to work outside your own front door so what's church all about specifically What's worship about? The survey dealt a lot with worship, and where this comes from is the elders a couple of years ago asked us about how do we evaluate this, and they wanted to, us to take a survey. So we designed a survey and took it a year ago and uh, got the results back, and I talked about the results back then. But they wanted to do it again to see what the comparison is and to see what happens. And so in the end of January and February, all of you were nice enough to give us your opinions. And uh, there's a lot of opinions. And we appreciate that because we know where you are and what you're thinking and how we're doing and how everybody's thinking about this. And uh, it's one of those things that's maybe a little bit exciting just to realize what God's able to do here. But how do we think about worship? And I've come to realize everybody thinks about it differently. So I'm going to give you just a short introduction to where I think it is. And yeah, it ties into Nehemiah. For me, a lot of times we want to start in Acts. But the real point, the real purpose in worship, I think, is in 1 Corinthians. And so when you start in 1 Corinthians, and we want to look at how do you build a church. Corinth wasn't perfect. It wasn't by any stretch the place that was a model church. And yet I think they are given instruction, and they are the ones who have what it means to really do worship and to have worship the way it's supposed to be. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26... He says, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Pretty simple. Small church, not like Jerusalem. Jerusalem had 3,000 that began on Pentecost. Corinth has 20. I don't know if you've been in those before or not. It's a very different type setting when everybody can sit around and we can all just talk. You try and do that with 400 plus people and you're going to get chaos. Everybody just gets to say whatever they want. It it just doesn't work out as well. And the one overriding principle that I see in this verse is people come together. The church assembles. 
It is in this assembly where the church gathers and where we come together as people of God. Each one has come with something, but everything they bring is for building up. Everything in worship is for building up. Depending on your version, some will say it's for edification. That's a big word to say, for building up. So that everybody is encouraged, everybody is uplifted. That's what it is for. It is not for solving all the world problems. It's not for giving you all the answers to your taxes. It's for building you up in Christ. And that's really what it's about. That's really what it's for. And so every single part needs to accomplish that one purpose. That purpose of building each other up. And so when we sing, we sing to gather, to build each other up. The worship is for us. It is us who is doing it. It is us who is giving this praise to God. And so everything, that is the first criteria. If it doesn't build up, then don't do it. It doesn't matter how much they did it in the New Testament. If it doesn't build you up, then it doesn't meet the first criteria. And the first criteria is that it needs to be where we would be built up. And so that's the first thing that you're able to see. This is part of a bigger section, and so let me expand it and give you the verses before this. They have had lots of difficulty, and they seem to struggle with their worship. And specifically with people who could speak in tongues and people who could prophesy and it just got kind of crazy and out of hand and all kinds of things that were happening and going on at the same time. And so as you look at this whole passage together, he says, If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and the outsider or unbeliever enters, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophecy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So the whole church comes together. The problem they were facing is they would have a person who had a genuine spiritual gift of being able to speak in a language that he didn't know and no one else there knew. Well, it's like listening to the Spanish channel. I don't get much out of it. I can see the people, I can watch them act, but I just really don't know what's going on. Some of you may already know Spanish, and so it would work great for you. But say it's in a different language. And so it was not building up for them. Even though it was a gift that was given by God, he says, I don't want you to just use a gift that is approved, that was given by God just because you can, if it does not build up. And so that's the first criteria. It needs to build up, but there's a lot more in here about how this all works. I don't think he's really trying to declare there's a right and a wrong. Worship all needs to be done. It needs to be done accurately, and if we have done accurately, that's what God wants. This passage does not present that concept at all. I don't think that's the point. Do we need to do it correctly? We need to do it correctly. But if it doesn't build up, All the correctness in the world is not going to accomplish what God wants done. And so the discussion that they're having here is how is worship meaningful? That's the discussion. And we tend to think about right and wrong. Is it sinful? Is it, maybe is it better? Is there a better way to do this? It might need some organization. It might be that we can do it a better way. So, our worship is for us. It's not specifically for outsiders. They are welcome. We're glad to have them come in. That's one of the best ways. Come watch. 
Come see what we do. This is what it looks like. Here is what happens when God is among us. And there's nothing more impressive than that. And so to praise and to encourage and to glorify God, to build up the body of Christ, for them to be part of that, that's great. You know, if someone wants to see, that's, that's really good. The only trouble is, he says, when they walked in, they might see just chaos. He says, don't have just chaos. That doesn't build anybody up. So that's the criteria that he's giving here. So Paul gives them some organization. And in this chapter, he's giving them, here are things that I want you to do. And so if we speak the word of God, if all prophesy, then he says people are convicted that this is personal. This is real. This is about me. This is God speaking directly to me. And they will give an account for his life. In other words, our life is challenged. It's called into question. And they can see their life and they can see their response to God. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. He sees himself before God. It isn't somebody else confessing your sin, okay? That, that's not what he's trying to describe here. But the secrets of his heart are disclosed to himself, and he sees himself really. And he's going to say, God's among you. Because God is every Sunday. And that's why we come here. And that's why worship is so meaningful and important. The point is it's a connection with God. And if you do it the same way, does it get you the same connection with God? I don't know. Have you felt that? Have you found that? The point is that worship is God among us. And I want to be in the place where God is, where God is worshiped, where God is respected, where we are challenged, where we are motivated, where... Our faith is able to shine where we're convicted of our sins, where we're convicted of our faith, where we're convicted of the work that we need to do, where it touches that secret place in your heart that says, you know what, here's what you need to do next, where you can feel the presence of God. It's about quality. And we have come before God. That, to me, is the goal of what we're trying to accomplish with worship. So I wanted to give you that part. It does take some organization from, and God is certainly doing that. We see that from Nehemiah, how the power of God is able to take a huge task that seemed impossible and took 92 years for them to figure out we haven't done this yet. And then all of a sudden in 52 days, if you get people together to do the work of God, it all comes together. We could sit here for a hundred years. And if we are not intent on doing the work of God and bringing it all together, it's not going to happen. But if we can get a little bit of organization and be able to do the things that God wants, then it's going to be able to do incredible things. So let me tell, give you what the survey is. And I'm just going to run through these real fast because one of the things is our worship service is too long. <laughs> I have two minutes. The first thing is the age range. Basically, the age range is from 51 and older. That's the biggest parts on here. 67% of them were from people who are 51 and older. We did not have our younger people sign it. I don't know why. We asked for them to. But this does not reflect younger people and their opinion. So this is mainly older people. Um, we asked, how would you rate our worship? And we asked for a scale of 1 to 10. Here's what the scale looks like. Most people rated it pretty high. There's a couple, there's nothing on the first two, but there was two people on number three. Um, they're not enjoying it as they're sitting here. Uh, so 79% gave us an eight to 10 range. There's always room for improvement. Even if you give a person a 10, there's always room for improvement. But some people will never give you a 10 because there's always room for improvement. So... That's how it was. How encouraged are you when you leave worship was the next one. Are you edified? And that was an 82%. We're in the range from 8 to 10. 
you know, you always could be more, so nobody's gonna give you a 10, right? So anyway, this is what you can see. 37% was, were a 10. I don't think that means we're perfect. I think that means there's still a lot to do, but that's basically where it is. Are there areas of our worship that need to grow? Number one was technology, such as voices that come during communion. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's a hard field. <laughs> and I'm sure what happened is one of those people who was streaming at home flipped a channel and somehow it channeled through to our service, right? Yeah, I don't know that that's even possible. But anyway, it's a hard field to get all of this together and all of this right. And we have a good team of people working on it. Um, a lot of it was about song slides and about their advancing at the right time. Singing was another one uh, where there's an area to grow. And this had, we want new songs. We had old songs. Justin did that today. We sang new songs. We sang old songs. Everybody's happy, right? <laughs> because that's what we wanted. That's what I saw a lot of. The other thing was there's too many songs. Now, the one before said there's not enough songs. And so when we put in more songs, they said, well, now the service is longer, so we don't want more songs. So now, it, yeah, I know. Uh, third one was the length of the sermon. It's just too long, and I know I'm already going to be over. Uh, communion, they didn't want so many personal stories. They wanted more Bible. And I'm just kind of giving you a highlight of what this came back as 18 pages worth of stuff, so. I'm not gonna read all 18 pages. A lot of it had to do with creature comforts, basically. You know, I've got plans, and so, are there areas where you feel it was done well? Um, message was number one at 80%, singing at 76%. So there's a problem between what's needing to be better and what's done well, and I think people checked, you know what, this is really done well, but it needs to be better. And so, however we rate those, um, sometimes we feel like things are done well. Uh, the major thing that was put down um, was the service being too long. Just so you know, we plan for from 10.30 to 11.45. We are not trying to be shorter than that. So if your hope is to be shorter than that, that is not even on the radar. <laughs> we will take at least that long, so that's what's gonna happen. Now we will try not to be over that, which means I better hurry here. There's a lot of moving parts, and so if I don't get the, the guy who's doing the scripture reading up here by 11 o'clock, we are going to be late. I get from 11.05 to 11.30. If I don't quit by 11.30, which I'm three minutes over now, uh, we are going to be late, which leaves five minutes for the elders. If the elders take more than five minutes, including their prayer, we will be late. If the guy leading the closing song, those are not over five minutes. If the guy saying the closing prayer, it takes that kind of coordination to be able to make us get out on time. To me, that's not the most criteria. What I want to see is, is God among us? We'll still cry and get you out on time, though, okay? <laughs> the sermon's too long. That was another one. Uh, I just explained the procedure, and it's not always the sermon that's too long. Sometimes you get caught with it further down the line. Be aware of where you are, and that's what it is. Family worship, it was mixed. We need to stay in the time limit. That's going to happen next week, by the way. So Joel will be speaking. We'll try family worship, and, and that will work. Technology, a big detractor and a big help, both. Um, people like the streaming. People like, don't like that it you know, has glitches sometimes. That's just the nature of what we're trying to deal with. Um, the most significant one to me was the last question that we asked. And that was, are you willing to commit to helping Mesa grow in 2019? Wow. 
A hundred percent yes. And to me, that's what's important. Amen. We'll work on all the other stuff. We know we're not perfect. We realize that there's a lot of things and a lot of flux and a lot of different opinions. The survey was not to say that we're great. It's to see where we need to improve. We want to let Jesus build us together. Amen. We want to have God be among us. And we know God's been able to accomplish that with so many other people. Nehemiah is an inspiration. But we don't want to sit for 92 days, 92 years, and it not happen. So if you're willing, we want to be part of that. Amen. We want to invite God to be here with us. You can be part of that. We want you to be part of that. So if you've repented of your sins and been baptized into Christ, that's great. If you haven't started there yet, start there. If you haven't let us know we want to work here, well then absolutely let us know where you want to work. We want to put you to work. We want to be people who are working together as we are able to serve God. You guys are encouraging. You guys are uplifting because of what I can see God doing in your life. Shall we stand and sing?